Hi, welcome back to Philosophy 101. I am Chris Ann Moore, and this is Program 5. Program 5 will be on Taoism, the second part, and the Buddha. So, as we saw in the last episode, we were discussing the labeling mind. As we explored the nature of our minds, we attempted to become aware of our awareness, that is, to watch our thoughts. Hopefully, you began to have some insight into the nature of those thoughts, the fact that the mind is constantly chattering away at us, and that often the nature of those thoughts are negative. Our thoughts are fearful, they're judgmental, they're angry, they're caught in the past, often resentment and regret of the past, even happy memories are bittersweet because they're over, and they're caught in the future, which is often about fear. So after we looked at the nature of the chattering mind so that we could become aware of why it is important to become aware of your awareness. Because until you really realize just how negative the mind can be, you can't be inspired to try to change or control or understand that. And this negative nature of the mind has been commented on by philosophers, sages, and saints throughout history. Unfortunately, most people think only their mind is negative. They don't realize everybody else is up in the middle of the night as well. That, they're all, that we all have times where we can't get to sleep because we hear that negative mind chatter that's taken us over. Then we began to explore the nature of the mind in experience. What happens when we have an experience? For instance, a tree. When I experience a tree, the very first thing my mind does is divide that experience into the experiencer, the I, the subject, and that which is experienced, the tree or the object. My mind then labels that tree, oak, for instance, categorizes it, actually, tree, then my mind begins to judge the tree, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, true, false, and then my mind begins to desire something from the tree. And then I begin to strive and struggle to try to get what I desire. So that is what we covered in the last episode, and I want to look at this process a little more. When we end it last time, we are talking about what happens really, are we really separated? Is what we really experience so separated from the I? Because really, if you think about it, the tree and I are interdependent. The tree is breathing out oxygen. I'm breathing in oxygen. I am breathing out carbon dioxide. The tree is breathing in carbon dioxide. The tree is sucking up water from the ground and releasing it from its roots. And I drink and bathe in that water. So really, the tree and I are an inter, in an interdependent relationship. It isn't this separation. Another thing, as I said, when we label something, we think we've said something. We think that oak or our category tree means something, that we now know something about this object. We turn something into an object. But think about it. Is the tree really an object? Isn't it, in fact, a process? A process of pulling water up and releasing it, of unfurling leaves, of growing bark, of converting sunlight and a billion chemical reactions into matter and energy which fuels the entire planet. As soon as I say tree, oak, I think I've said something, but have I? Haven't I turned a process into an object? Hasn't my label, in a sense, missed more than it's actually captured? We do this with everything we experience. We do this with people. When you meet people, don't you label them? Don't you categorize them? Oh, geek. Stoner, homosexual, Jew, Christian. And what do all these labels have to do? What do they really say about the living, breathing, crying, struggling, laughing, dancing, making love human being? What do our labels say? Very little about the totality of that life, of that process, of that being. And yet, by our labels, those people can be loved or rejected. In fact, by some of those labels, it can mean life or death. But how much is that label missing? You see, our mind takes snapshots of what we experience. That is why when I say picture a tree, you can imagine a tree. You can bring a picture up in your mind. Because not only does our mind label, but it takes a snapshot. And as I said before, this has many wonderful functions. But the problem happens is when we mistake our snapshots for the reality. For imagine this, I'm on vacation. I'm on the prow of a boat. 
I'm fishing. And I see that there's a storm coming in. The sky is beginning to turn gray, and there's kind of an electric crackling energy in the air. And the, the waves are bouncing off the, the prow of the boat, and they're catching in my eye, and my in my hair and my eyes and my hair is whipping about and I can taste the salt and smell the fish and there's a slight scent of danger in the air and just at that moment somebody says smile and they take a snapshot and then I get home and I say here's a picture of my vacation what does that picture capture of that moment doesn't it really miss more than it actually captures but we make this mistake we mistake our pictures for the experience. And that is where our mind becomes an obstacle to truth. There's a great story that captures this actually about Picasso's Cubist period. I don't know if you've ever seen paintings from this period, but what Picasso was trying to do is he was trying to capture a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional surface. And so his figures, the eyes, the breasts, the arms, they're in very odd places. And the pictures will look quite different than what some of us see a human being to be. So, in this story, a guy comes up to Picasso in a bar and he says, you know what? Your pictures are an insult to women. Women don't look like that. Picasso says, really? Picasso says, yeah. He pulls a picture of his wife out of his back pocket and he goes, you see this? That's what a woman looks like. So Picasso takes the picture and he says, huh. So that's what your wife looks like. Now he's getting mad, right? So he's like, yeah, why? Picasso just looks calmly at the picture and says, huh, oh, you sure your wife looks like this? The guy starts to get mad now, so he's like, yeah, what's your point? Picasso says, awfully small and flat, isn't she? See, that's the point. His wife is not two inches high. His wife isn't flat. The man had mistaken the picture for the reality. And that's what we do. Have you ever s been on a beach and there's this magnificent sunset and somebody says, oh, it's just like a movie. Well, haven't they gotten it backwards? Isn't the movie capturing the sunset and not the other way around? You see, we begin when we think our labels have captured the reality of experience, when we get caught in our mental pictures and when we get caught in our labels, we miss the wholeness, the fullness, the process of reality. So, after our mind labels and categorizes, it judges. In fact, the process of labeling itself is a form of judgment. When I say geek or stoner or homosexual or Jew or Christian or atheist, that process of labeling actually contains within it a judgment. But we judge everything, as I said before, good, bad, true, false, right, wrong. But there are some insights that say that perhaps our ability to judge is skewered, since our labels and our images and our snapshots are so limited that they're unable to capture the whole of this process of interdependent and interwoven experience, that perhaps our judgments are themselves false. That perhaps that we do not have enough information to judge. Just as you can't really judge another human being until you have walked a mile in their shoes at least, how much are we really able to capable of judging anything, of knowing good from bad, beautiful from ugly, true from false. This is captured by the story of a Chinese farmer. Now, this farmer's son is out in the fields and he is thrown by a horse and he breaks both his legs. It's a very old story. And the villagers come and they find the boy and they bring him back to the house and as they are carrying him and lying him out in the bed, they say to the Chinese farmer, oh, such a tragedy. We're so sorry. Such a terrible thing. And the Chinese farmer says, maybe good, maybe bad. Well, of course, the villagers are quite flummoxed by this. They're certain that what has happened is bad. Until two weeks from then, the Chinese army descends on the village, and they conscript every young man in the village. Except, of course, the Chinese farmer's son. 
and every other young man in the village is marched off to war, and every other young man in the village dies. So, was the two broken legs good, or was the two broken legs bad? See, we can only perceive a moment in time. We can only perceive by our labels and categories. So therefore, do we ever really know if something is good or bad? And of course, after this process of labeling, categorizing, judging, then we desire. We want something. We want something from the tree. We want something from the human beings we meet. We want them to like us. We want them to ask us out. We want them to be our friends. Or we want them to go away. We want them to shut up. We wish they used better personal hygiene. We want something. Is our immediate response to those experiences we take notice of. Well, let's look at the desire nature of the human mind. What happens when a desire is fulfilled? That's right. You have 10 more desires take its place. We run around trying to fill our desires, but every time we find something that we desire, then there's something else we desire. Think about it. I want a CD, a CD player. As soon as we get a CD player, we want a CD, MP3, CDRW player. As soon as we get a CD, MP3, CDRW player, well, then we need a nice cabinet to put it in. And then we need speakers for the surround sound. And we have our CD, MP3, CDRW player, and we have our speakers for the surround sound. And we have our cabinets. Well, then we need a couch. And as soon as we need a couch, well, we want to have people over, so we need a mini fridge so we can get food. And then I need more money. It's like, and it goes on and on and on. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Every desire birthing another desire. But where is the moment of satisfaction? Maybe it's momentary. But as soon as one desire arises, or you work to fulfill it, as soon as that desire is fulfilled, ah, another desire. You know the syndrome. It's the I'll be happy when syndrome. I'll be happy when I graduate from college. Oh, no, no, that's not it. I'll be happy when I get a job. Oh, no, 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 that's not it. It's just an entry-level position. I'll be happy when I get a promotion and I'm actually making the money that I think I need. Oh, no, that's not it. The promotion isn't quite enough. I'll be happy when I save enough money so I can buy a house in Hawaii. <sighs> well, then I'll never be happy because I'm never going to be able to afford a house in Hawaii. But it keeps going on and on and on, this wanting nature. But when is the fulfillment? Sure, when we get something, there's a moment of pleasure. But how long does it really last? I had this experience really recently, actually. I bought an armoire, you know, a TV cabinet, one of those freestanding wood cabinets. I wanted this armoire for a really long time. And it was really expensive. But I saved up my money, and I got my armoire. And I finally got it home, which was a major hassle because I refused to pay the shipping fee. But I got my armoire home, and then I had to set up the VCR, and I had to set up the CD player, and I had to set this up, and I had to get the wires straight, and I got the speakers put in, and I got it all set up. And finally, after hours, there was my armoire, and I stood back, and my the first thought was, it needs a rug. And I caught myself, and I thought, Chrisanne, I'm doing it. And at least I caught myself, but it was <gasps> immediately. We think that as soon as we have our desires, we're going to be happy. But as soon as we have that desire fulfilled, there's another desire. I was in Bali once for about six weeks. I was traveling on doing some research. And I was going really cheaply. So I didn't have hot water for oh, six weeks. So I thought, when I get home and I have hot water, I am going to never, ever take hot water for granted again. And I remember when I first got home and I got in that shower and that hot water was coming down, I was like, oh. This is the best thing ever. How long do you think that lasted? It was like maybe a week before I was back in my old routine, and I'm in the shower in the morning thinking, well, i got to get this done, i got to get this done. And my appreciation, my desire, that longing for hot water as soon as it was fulfilled. Hot water, huh? Now we're on to the next thing. See, our desires keep us running, and we want, and we want, and we want, and we want, and we run, and we struggle, and we struggle, and we run, and we run, filling our desires and getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, if you're an American. And then you're working two jobs to fill the debt, to fill the desire. <sighs> Until it's exhausting. But where in that is happiness? See, the desire nature of our own minds can drive us nuts. Because 
We desire something and we can't achieve it, which is absolute frustration. We desire something and we achieve it and we appreciate it for a moment and then the desire is gone. We want something else. Or we desire something and we achieve it, but then we have to hold on to it. We have to worry about keeping it, our health, our money. We finally lose 10 pounds, we gotta, stay, we gotta keep it off, right? And then we begin to worry about losing the object of our desire. Because as soon as we desire, we start striving and struggling and manipulating to get what we desire. We start in the rat race, the running and the wanting and the running and the wanting and the running and the wanting and until we drive ourselves absolutely crazy. But this is the nature of the ego mind. Separate, I, it, label, categorize, judge, desire, manipulate. So, as I said before, the labeling mind has its uses. As I said before, I have been using the labeling mind to point to the problems with the labeling mind. And in fact, most Western philosophies will use the labeling mind to try to find the path to wisdom. Socrates, for instance, will teach us to define correctly, to label correctly. Aristotle will teach us to categorize correctly. As just one example, genus and species are Aristotle's categories. And much of Western philosophy will be devoted to figuring out how to judge correctly. So let's look at some of this in Western philosophy. Okay, so as we saw, Western philosophy will look to the mind for answers. And in fact, Western philosophy will seek to train and organize the reasoning mind. In fact, entire branches of Western philosophy will be devoted to teaching us how to make right judgments. The branches of Western philosophy developed to establishing how to make correct judgments Good from bad will be ethics. Beautiful and ugly will be aesthetics. And truth from false will be called logic. On the other hand, Asian philosophies, like many Western religions, will see the mind as the problem. That see that our normal ways of thinking and our normal awareness not as a route to wisdom, but rather as an obstacle to wisdom. And one of those Asian philosophers that many of the insights that I just gave you about the labeling mind came from was Lao Tzu. So now we're going to look at Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu lived around 575 BC in China. He lived at the time of the Warring States. This was a time when different Chinese dynasties were vying for rule of the empire, and it was an extremely conflict-ridden, bloody, and war-torn time. And Lao Tzu, as the legends say, was a bureaucrat in the Chinese government. And at the age of around 160, Lao Tzu finally got sick and tired of the conditions of his world, and he left to go into the mountains to be with nature. And as legends say, a gatekeeper stopped Lao Tzu on the way into the mountains and said, please do not leave us without giving us some of your wisdom. And so the story is Lao Tzu sat down and he wrote the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is a slim volume. It's actually only 81 pages in length. And on each of those pages is just a few lines of verse. And yet the Tao Te Ching has become one of the most influential books in Chinese history, and actually, it is the second most translated book in the Western world. The first most translated. The first, the book with the most translations is, of course, the Bible. So we can see how important this slim little book of 81 pages is. Now, there is some disagreement as to whether Lao Tzu actually lived or not, if he's simply a legendary figure. And there are those who claim that the Tao Te Ching is a compilation of sayings that later became put together and then developed into Taoist philosophy and Taoist religion. That's not as important for us here. What's important for us here is some of the insights that can be gathered from Lao Tzu's book. So I'm just going to stay with the tradition of attributing these thoughts and ideas to Lao Tzu. In the Tao Te Ching, 
Lao Tzu describes the Tao, which is the way or the path. Um, interestingly enough, the Tao cannot be captured in words. This is one of the very first things that Lao Tzu tells us. In fact, what he's saying from the beginning is that our labeling, categorizing, judging, desiring, manipulating mind cannot comprehend, cannot see the Tao, because in fact, the Tao transcends all labels. But of course, we can't stop talking about the Tao, because the Tao is everything. And so in attempting to write about that which cannot be spoken, Lao Tzu uses paradox and poetry. That is why there's just a few lines on every page. And yet by examining those few lines, that paradox and poetry, we can come to some understanding of Lao Tzu's vision. And part of that vision is, like many early philosophers and sages, the da Lao Tzu saw the world as just one thing. We use the circle for that idea that everything is just one thing. In other words, everything that we experience, everything that we are, manifests out of this one thing. And this is what Lao Tzu called the Tao. But the Tao is not only everything, the one, and everything that manifests out of the one. It is also the laws by which everything manifests. And it is also the way in which one is to behave in order to be in harmony or accord with all that manifests. So, in order to try to capture the uncaptural in words, the closer we can come to the Tao is that it is the way, it is all that is, and it is the laws by which everything works. Lao Tzu tells us that the Tao is composed of two opposing forces. Um, that from these opposite forces, one called yin and one called yang, everything else manifests. You may be familiar with this symbol. This is a symbol of the Tao. One of these forces is called yin and is known as all things dark or negative, cold and wet. The lighter force is called yang, everything which is light or positive, warm and dry. And as you'll see in the picture, yin always contains a little bit of yang, and yang always contains a little bit of yin. And it's through the interaction of these two forces that everything manifests. Everything comes from the flowing of one to the other, day into night, life into death, youth into age, hot into dry, cold into warm. Everything is a combination of these two forces moving together, each containing the other. And this is the way that the one becomes the many things. The nameless becomes the multitude of named things that become separated out when we become aware of them because we label them and categorize them. Just as God had Adam do in the Garden of Eden, name. Naming is the beginning of consciousness. When we begin to name all the different manifestations of the Tao, we separate them out from the One. In this process of flow, everything, according to Lao Tzu's vision, is perfect. Everything arises and falls back again in perfect harmony. But we are unable to see this because our labeling and categorizing and dividing mind separ separates us out from this process. But on top of this, our desiring mind interferes with this process. Lao Tzu writes, always rid yourself of desire in order to observe its secrets. He also writes, have as little thought as possible, has a, have as little thought of self and as few desires as possible. You see, once the mind begins to desire and begins to manipulate to achieve the object of its desire, the mind interferes with the harmonious flow of the Tao. Because as we are manipulating to achieve our desires, we always bring in the opposite of that which we desire. So, for example, for instance, you are looking for the pleasure of strong drink. You want to party all night long. 
What is the result of that pleasure? The result of that pleasure is, of course, the pain of a hangover the next morning. Or suppose in the opposite, if you go through the physical pain of working out, you end up with the pleasure of having a healthy, beautiful body. Every time we go for one thing, we actually manifest it the opposite as well, because the two cannot be divided from one another. They are intimately intertwined. And one of the sources of human misery is that human beings desire to have yin without yang. They want what they're going for, but they don't want the opposite. We want love without grief. But that is an impossibility. We want youth without age, but that is an impossibility. We want life without death, but that is an impossibility. And in seeking for the impossible, we chain ourselves to endless frustration. As people search to, to manifest the object of their desire, they become frustrated and annoyed that they also get the opposite. For example, you can't go to the beach without getting sand in your bathing suit. But people are all the time going to the beach and being shocked that they get sand in their bathing suit. It's a little ridiculous. I live in the country. I have a really beautiful backyard and I have picnics there. And I'm always shocked because people will come up and they will ah, they'll say, my gosh, it's beautiful. And then they'll complain about the bugs. But the fact is you can't get beautiful country and not get bugs. You can't have yin without yang. So our desiring causes us endless frustration as we try to separate yin from yang, which is no more possible than separating the head from the tail of a coin. But not only does our desiring interfere, cause us frustration, our desiring actually interferes with the functioning of the Tao. Lao Tzu and Taoists would indicate that the Tao functions perfectly on its own. Everything happens as exactly as it should happen. But our desiring and striving and manipulating and struggling interferes with this harmonious action. So, there is only one way to achieve harmony with the Tao, and that is to stop. In order to achieve harmony with the Tao, we have to stop. We have to stop willing, wanting, striving, struggling, manipulating. We also have to stop labeling categorizing and judging. In other words, in order to achieve harmony with the Tao, we need to stop the ego mind. We need to stop the functions of the ego mind. As a matter of fact, Lao Tzu would teach that in order to achieve harmony, we must achieve Wu Wei. So in order to achieve harmony with the Tao, we must find non-action which is not acting from the ego mind. When we stop striving and struggling and manipulating and desiring, when we stop, according to Lao Tzu, we will be in harmony with the Tao, and we will know exactly what to do. And our actions will always be right. But our labeling and categorizing and judging and desiring and manipulating and striving and struggling prevents us from seeing what would be natural and spontaneous and perfect. But if we can achieve a state of wu wei, of non-action, non-action from the ego mind, then we can act spontaneously and naturally, and our actions will be perfect. So really, wu wei is not, is not about doing nothing. It's about doing from a place of no mind, a place from no desire, a place from no striving and struggling. Now, it is often very difficult for Westerners in particular to understand what Lao Tzu is talking about in terms of non-action, in terms of stopping willing and wanting and desiring. As a matter of fact, most of my students would say, if I stop desiring, I'm not going to be here. I'm certainly not going to be taking a telecourse right now because the only reason I'm in the room is because I desire an education, because I desire a better job, because I desire a better life for me and my family. So, we see desire as that which motivates and inspires, and without that, what will we do? So, in order to try to capture some of the essence of what Wu Wei is talking about, if you've ever had a moment of great athletic performance, 
or if you've had, ever had a moment of great performance, period, you might understand Wu Wei. I know I understand it best from the days when I played basketball. There were times when I was playing basketball and I would be dribbling the ball and I would always be where the ball was and every shot I took went in and I was in the zone. But as soon as I thought, wow, every shot's going in, the shot bounces out of the basket and misses. As soon as my ego mind entered in, my zone was gone. Now this is true of all great athletes, all great performers. They're able to achieve that state of no mind when action happens spontaneously. They are just, of course, able to achieve it for much longer periods of time than me in my few moments of basketball glory. But this is something that also great surfers know about. You see, the, the calculating ego mind can't really determine when to hit a wave. There are so many factors of weather and ocean that if the mind gets involved, there's no hitting the wave properly. However, if you can achieve this state of no mind, you just know. And there you are riding the wave. That is why so many surfers believe that uh, surfing is such a spiritual experience because it requires that state of no mind. Or if you think about it, let's take a tennis match. You can practice your backhand and practice your backhand and practice your backhand, but if a ball is coming at you at 90 minute miles an hour, you can't think, oh, I think I should use my backhand. Because of course the ball is going to be out of the court. You're not going to have that moment to say. So you have to be in that perfect harmony of no mind in order to play a great game of tennis. Well, we can have hints of these in athletic performance or hints of these in the great performances of the great masters and artists. As a matter of fact, it is this no mind state which is the goal of much Japanese artistry, of Zen archery, for instance. In Zen in the art of archery, uh, Eric Hegel, oh, let me get his, Herigel, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, writes that you do not try to hit the target, but you cannot miss. When you stop striving and struggling to hit the target, you cannot miss the target. So this is, gives us some indication of what we mean by Wu Wei. Unfortunately, the concept of Wu Wei, or going with the flow, is often misinterpreted by Westerners. They can't really understand dropping desire, but when they try, they think that going with the flow means getting stoned, eating Cheetos, and watching TV. That if they just let go, things will show up at their doorway. This is a complete misinterpretation because these people are not going with the flow. They're simply releasing to their lowest desires. Lao Tzu doesn't say release to your lowest desires and let go to them. Lao Tzu is saying stop desiring entirely. Now, obviously, uh, the Taoist sages spend lifetimes in meditation and in search and understanding, and we can only begin to touch on some of the insights of Lao Tzu in this show. But this idea of stopping willing and wanting and desiring in order to achieve happiness is we will find in many religions and many great philosophers throughout the world this is what we will have in common what we will find in common in these religions in addition when you stop willing and wanting and labeling and categorizing and desi desiring Lao Tzu indicates that you also stop judging and when you stop judging then you can be truly moral for what should arise from this non-judgment is harmlessness and helpfulness. Let me read you some of Taoist ethics, some of Lao Tzu's ethics. Lao Tzu writes, the sage puts his person last and it comes first. The sage also does not harm the people. Lao Tzu writes, do good to him who has done you an injury. He writes, through compassion, one will triumph. And finally, having given all to others, he is richer still. As we shall see in, sub as we shall see in subsequent chapters, these sayings are extremely 
similar to the sayings of Jesus, to the sayings of Buddha, to the sayings of Socrates, that each of these great philosophers and sages will indicate that stopping willing and desiring is the way to happiness. Each of these sages will indicate that harmlessness and helpfulness will be the way to achieve enlightenment or salvation. And so the fact of this similarity um, is one of the greatest arguments, I think, for the, the existence of a universal ethic. Okay, so we will see many of these similarities actually in our next philosopher, which is Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha Gautama was later known as the Buddha or the Enlightened One. Siddhartha lived from 560 to 480 BC. As the story goes, Siddhartha was born in Nepal, which is uh, at that time was part of India. Siddhartha was the son of a wealthy family. He was a prince. His family had decided to protect Siddhartha from any signs of suffering. And so he was surrounded always by beautiful, healthy people. In fact, all his desires were indulged. In fact, his parents went so far, the story says, as to build a wall around the lands of their estate. Now, their estate was quite large, but Siddhartha was not allowed to leave the estate because they didn't want him to be exposed to the suffering and brutality of the world outside. However, of course, Siddhartha did eventually become a teenager, and we know what teenagers do with walls. They go over them. And when Siddhartha went into the city, he was shocked by what he saw. In fact, he was much more shocked than anyone else would be because he had never seen suffering before. And so Siddhartha saw what became known as the four signs. Now, the very first three of these signs, Siddhartha encountered a destitute beggar. And so for the first time, Siddhartha saw poverty. Next, Siddhartha saw a dead man being prepared for cremation. And so Siddhartha was shocked by being confronted with the reality of death. Then Siddhartha saw a diseased and handicapped person. And so with these three signs, Siddhartha was shocked to see that there was suffering and there was death. And he realized that life itself was suffering because he came to the realization that disease and sickness is unavoidable if one is a human being. And death is unavoidable if one is a human being. And poverty threatens, regardless of how much wealth you have. And even if you are wealthy, when those around you are impoverished and suffering, that too is suffering. He saw that life inevitably and unavoidably contains suffering. But what's worse than that is he realized that his life back in the castle, he hadn't been happy. Even when all his desires were being fulfilled, he had been dis content. He had not found contentment there. And that is when eventually Siddhartha ran into the fourth sign. In the fourth sign, Siddhartha met an ascetic monk. Now an ascetic, let's look at the definition of ascetic. Ascetic is an individual who turns away from pleasure and severely limits all sensual appetite in order to achieve salvation or enlightenment. And so the ascetic really controls all the desires of the body and doesn't indulge sensual appetite at all. But when Siddhartha met this ascetic, he looked into his eyes and he saw for the very first time peace and contentment. Siddhartha was a little older now and he wanted that peace and contentment for himself. And so Siddhartha left his family and estate and he went in search of this peace that he saw in the ascetic's eyes. By this time, in fact, Siddhartha was married and had children, but he left his family behind and he began a very long journey in which he sought for enlightenment. He sought to find a way out of the world's suffering. And Siddhartha spent many years going, uh, searching from guru to guru. He learned to be an ascetic. He learned to control his body. As a matter of fact, it is said that at one point, Siddhartha had become so thin that you could touch his spine when you touched his belly. But even though Siddhartha had gained control of his body, he, was, um, he had not yet found peace and contentment. He had not yet found the enlightenment that he was looking for. As a matter of fact, he realized that, in a way, asceticism was just another way of showing off. 
And so Siddhartha determined that as far as the body was, is concerned, the middle way is best. The middle way means a path of moderation between indulgence and denial of the body. Siddhartha believed that indulging every appetite was not going to bring happiness and contentment, but also denial of the body was not going to be happiness and contentment either. And so as far as the body was concerned, one should take a middle path of moderation, of temperance. But still Siddhartha had to find enlightenment. And so the story goes that one day he saw a tree by a river and he determined that he would sit by that tree until he had achieved enlightenment. A woman came by and gave Siddhartha a golden bowl full of rice milk. One story says that he drank it all in one gulp. Another says that he sparsely, he um, had a little bit each day. But Siddhartha went un into meditation under that tree and he said he would not move until he had achieved enlightenment. Siddhartha, after 49 days, finally achieved what, what he was looking for. It was May 524 B.C., a day that has become holy ever since in the Buddhist traditions. Siddhartha Gautama achieved nirvana or enlightenment, and from then on he was known as the Buddha. What can be said of nirvana? Strangely enough, it cannot be captured in words. This is something that all mystics in all traditions have said, interestingly enough, that when they have had that enlightenment experience, that mystical experience, it cannot be translated into the words of the labeling, ca categorizing ego mind. In fact, that is one of the reasons why it is believed that the labeling, categorizing ego mind interferes with this achievement of this consciousness. But Buddha did say that there is no suffering and there is also no I. There is consciousness, but there is no me being conscious, which is very hard for us to, trapped in our labeling mind to even understand. So the closest we can come to describing nirvana is to say that it cannot be described in words. It is a state of pure consciousness with no suffering. It is a blissful, egoless state. Well, now Siddhartha had achieved nirvana. He had a decision to make because, of course, he could stay in this blissful consciousness and all suffering for him would be over. However, he was still aware that there were others still suffering. And so Buddha's decision was, does he stay in this state or does he return to help others out of their suffering? And it is said in the Buddhist traditions that all the world shook while the Buddha made his decision. But of course we know the decision that he made because Buddha returned to teach others how to achieve nirvana and escape suffering. And thus the Buddha became what is known as a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is an enlightened being who voluntarily propones his, postpones his or her own nirvana in order to help all other sentient or conscious beings escape from suffering. And so Buddha returned to teach others how to escape from suffering. Interestingly, before we talk about what Buddha did teach, it's interesting to note what Buddha did not teach. What we want to look for at first is the questions that Buddha did not answer. Because Buddha did not seek to tell how the universe began or how old it is or what it is made of or how one thing becomes another. In fact, when questioned about these things, the Buddha said it was as if a man were shot by an arrow. If a man were shot by an arrow and he were on the floor bleeding, you don't think he would say, what's the arrow made of? He wouldn't ask where it came from. He wouldn't ask who, how fast it traveled. He would simply want to remove the arrow and end his suffering. And since all human beings were then, as they are now, suffering, Buddha was not concerned with answering all of these questions. He was in concerned instead with helping us end our suffering, helping us remove this, that arrow. 
Now we will look at the center of what Buddha did teach. And at the center of Buddha's teaching are the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are life is suffering. Suffering is caused by ego-centered desire. Here we have that concept again. Suffering is caused by ego-centered desire. But the good news is suffering can be ended. And suffering is ended by following the Eightfold Path. So, in order to understand Buddha's route to um, alleviating suffering from escape from suffering, we must look at the Eightfold Path, of course. But before we can look at the Eightfold Path, we have to look at a couple of notions which are extremely important to understanding Buddhist philosophy. And the first of these notions is that of reincarnation. Reincarnation is the idea that we are born, we live, we die, and then we are born again. We live, we die, and we are born again. This idea of reincarnation, that we live many, many lives, is not singular to Buddhism. As a matter of fact, it was part of Hindu philosophy. Um, and Hindu philosophy was popular in India at the time Buddha, Buddha taught. However, it's been a very important part of many religions and philosophies. There's indications of belief in reincarnation, as I said, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, but also many early Christianities believed in reincarnation. There's some evidence, in fact, that the earliest Catholic Church believed in reincarnation, but it was later eliminated. Also, the earliest Greek philosophers believed in reincarnation. It's a very important part of their philosophies. Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras all believed in reincarnation. This is important to Buddhist philosophy because in Buddha's philosophy, this process of return to life is a return to suffering. So part of Buddhist philosophy is to escape from this constant cycle of reincarnation which is suffering, to achieve nirvana so that one does not reincarnate. One is released into bliss. Of course, there are those who believe that nirvana can only be achieved after one's last lifetime. There are other Buddhist philosophies, however, that believe that nirvana can be achieved as the Buddha achieved it during one's lifetime. There are actually many different sects of Buddhist religion and there are many Buddhist philosophies, just as there are many Christian sects and many Christian philosophies. And of course, we cannot possibly, um, with any respect, you know, do, do well by all of them. We're simply talking about the very essence of Buddhist teaching. But this notion of reincarnation is important to all of these Buddhist philosophies, as it is important to so many other philosophies. So, let's look at that. Reincarnation. The belief that we live many lives. We are born, we live, we die, and then we are born again as a different being. The second concept that is very important to understand in order to understand Buddhism is the idea of karma. Karma, simply put, is the law of moral causation. Most of you are aware of this as the idea that what goes around comes around. What goes around comes around. In other words, what you do shall be done to you. If you lie, you'll be lied to. If you cheat, you'll be cheated. If you love, you'll be loved. If you steal, you'll be stolen from. So this idea of karma is that what we put out comes back to us. However, for Buddha, it wasn't just in our actions that what we put out comes back to us. As a matter of fact, what we put out in thought comes back to us. It is not just our actions, but the very nature of our thoughts. In the Dharmapada, the Buddha writes, The man who thinks good thoughts, goodness shall follow him as the wheels of the cart must follow the ox. For the man who thinks evil thoughts, evil shall follow him as the wheels of the cart shall follow the ox. In other words, the very nature of your thoughts become manifested and come back to you. This is a fascinating concept, not just what you do, but what you think, which makes it even more important that we aware, become aware of our awareness, that we become aware of our thoughts, as we saw in the last episode, in the beginning of this one, that negative, chattering mind entraps us. And Buddha even indicates that it is part of our karma. 
Now, the idea of karma has become popularized, and there have been some misunderstandings of what karma actually is. There are some people who believe that everything that happens to anyone is karma. That is an exaggeration. For example, if you're walking down the street and a brick falls off a building and hits you on the head, it may be karma. It also may be that a brick fell off a building and hit you on the head, that it was weakened by earthquakes or weather. You see, it is very difficult for any individual to determine um, what may be a result of karma and what may not be. And so, unfortunately, those who think that everything is a result of karma are very quick to blame people for their own problems. Some people say, well, you know, if someone's homeless, it's their karma, or if someone has cancer, it's their karma. This is extremely mistaken and even dangerous position to take. The fact is, is it's hard enough to know for yourself when something might be karma or not. And it certainly should be uh, very careful in judging when something is someone else's karma or not. Okay, so now that we understand the ideas of reincarnation, we can begin to look at what exactly is the Eightfold Path, the, Buddha, the path that Buddha gave to release us from suffering. The Eightfold Path, begins with right understanding. Now, many volumes of philosophy have been written about the Eightfold Path. And these involve profound insights, but we'll just be able to touch on some of them here. That said, right understanding, what is meant by right understanding is the understanding of the fact that life is suffering. You see, most people don't think that life is suffering. Or they think, well, their life is suffering and nobody else's is. Or they think their life is suffering just right now, but they'll work it out, that happiness is just around the corner, just around the bend. And they really believe that they will be able to figure it out, that the mind, with its desiring and its manipulating, will figure out how to attain happiness. And as long as anyone, someone believes that, they are missing the first noble truth that life is suffering and therefore they can't begin to even search for nirvana until you realize that you are suffering you will not look for release from suffering as you long as you believe that happiness can be achieved through the mind as long as you believe that happiness can be achieved through the film fulfillment of desire as long as you believe that you can work it out you can't begin on the path it's interesting, in fact, that many uh, Buddhist teachers, as well as many Christian ministers, have some of their most tremendous success in prisons. That there are people who are on death row, or life imprisonment, who have had gained enlightenment or had mystical experiences. Now, of course, some of these are tall tales meant to get parole or commutation of a sentence. But also, most assuredly, some of these are true. Now, why would that be? Well, that's because these people on death row, these people stuck in prison realize, finally, some of them, that their own best thinking got them there. When you're confronted that your own best thinking got you at the bottom, maybe that's when you're willing to let go of your own thinking. But of course, most of us are not in prison. Thank you. And because we're not at the bottom, we continue to believe that our manipulating and our striving and our struggling and our desiring will bring happiness. But it's not until you give up on that that you can really begin on the path to nirvana. And so that brings us to the second of the Eightfold Path, and that is right purpose, which is once you realize that you are suffering, then you can begin to attempt to transcend that suffering. And in order to transcend that suffering, you need to end ego-centered desire. And so it is in the attempt to end ego-centered desire that one begins moving on the Eightfold Path. Now, the next three aspects of the Eightfold Path all have to do with karma, actually. Right speech, right conduct, and right livelihood all refer to behaving in such a way that you do not entrap yourself with harm. So, we have gone over in this episode, we've finished on the labeling and categorizing mind. We've gone through the philosophy of Lao Tzu, 
some basics of Taoism, and we've begun to explore the life and philosophy of Buddha. When we come back for our next episode, we will finish looking at the Eightfold Path, and then we will begin to look at the birth of Greek philosophy. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.